So my name is Amal Starling. Um, I'm a neurologist here at Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I am a headache specialist here. And I'm very pleased uh, to be here tonight to talk to everyone about um, a very exciting new treatment uh, regimen uh, that is coming through for migraine patients. So these are the CGRP drugs or the anti-CGRP treatments. So I see that a couple people have started to log on, which is great. Um, if someone could go ahead and give me a thumbs up or um, a, uh, a confirmation that my audio is coming through appropriately, that would be great. Oh, well, not only did people say that they can hear me, but they're starting with the questions right away, which is absolutely wonderful. As you guys go ahead and um, fill in some questions for me, I do want to give you a quick overview uh, regarding migraine and uh, the treatment of migraine with the anti-CGRP treatments. Just to take it back, um, I do want to be clear with everybody that migraine is a neurologic disease. And for a lot of patients that have migraine, it's not enough to have just a rescue medication. They need to have a preventive uh, treatment regimen as well as a rescue medication. My favorite analogy to use with my patients is actually asthma. So when people have asthma and they have an attack, they don't just say, oh, I have asthmas two days a week. They actually say that they have asthma all the time, and then occasionally they will have an asthma attack. For the attack, they need a rescue inhaler, and then to treat the underlying disease of asthma, they need some sort of preventive plan. Think about migraine the same way. For migraine patients, you always have migraine. The disease is always present. The abnormal function in the brain that causes migraine is always there, whether you're having an attack or not. So for many people with migraine, they need to be preventively treating their migraine disease, and then they acutely, or when they have an attack, they have to use a rescue treatment. Now, there are um, a lot of people that need preventive migraine medications, but they're not on it. So the statistics show that there are only 10% of people who are taking preventive medications when they should be. So that means that 90% of people who should be on a preventive medication for the treatment of migraine are not. Now, why are these people not on a preventive medication? Those reasons vary. And one of those reasons is because a lot of the preventive medications that we have are simply not effective. So backing up another step, are medications the only option? And that was actually one of the questions that came through. Are medications the only options for the prevention of migraine? And the answer is no. There's a lot of behavioral approaches, such as biofeedback and cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which has evidence-based uh, benefit for people with migraine. There are also supplements that can be helpful, such as magnesium, vitamin B2, coenzyme Q10, feverfew. There are also some new devices. Um, I know Dr. Stu Tepper uh, gave an excellent Facebook Live about neuromodulation devices, some of which can be helpful in migraines, such as the cephaly, the STMS uh, device, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and then also the non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation device. These are all devices uh, that are being introduced for the treatment of migraine, some of which are already FDA approved. And so those devices are available. There's also some procedures. Um, some individuals benefit from nerve blocks, other individuals benefit from onobotulinum toxin A injections. But oral medications are the most common preventive option for many, many patients. And like I said, only about 10% of patients that should be on a medication are actually on a preventive treatment regimen. And like I said before, the reason that happens is because a lot of these preventive medications are not effective or they cause a ton of side effects. And I know several of you have uh, mentioned that um, in the comments already. And so what we know um, is that once people start a preventive medication, the discontinuation rates are very, very high. 
Um, in fact, studies have shown that greater than 80% of individuals stop their oral preventive medications um, after, they, after they've been prescribed it um, over the course of a year. So very few people are actually taking their oral medication because they don't work, because they cause side effects. So how can we better treat migraine? Well, number one, we need a treatment that is targeted for the disease. The preventive medications that we have right now, they are designed for other diseases, such as high blood pressure, um, depression, as well as seizures. And we found that they are effective for some people that have migraine. But they're not designed for migraine. And so because of that, they're not as effective as targeted treatments may be, disease-specific treatments may be, and also, they cause a lot of side effects, and we hope that targeted treatments would not cause these side effects because they would be specific for the disease process itself. So what we need to do is understand what is happening in migraine. So in migraine, it's abnormal function inside of the brain, and it results in alterations of different neurotransmitters as well as neuropeptides, which is just a fancy name for a protein in the brain. One of these proteins is called CGRP. It stands for calcitonin gene-related peptide. Over the course of the last several decades, scientists have found that CGRP is elevated during a migraine attack. And with effective treatment of a migraine attack, that level of CGRP is decreased. In addition, if you give someone CGRP, like an infusion or an injection of CGRP, they will develop a migraine-like headache. Also, in people who have chronic migraine, which is a severe form of migraine, in which individuals are having 15 or more headache days per month, in those individuals, CGRP is elevated higher than people who have episodic migraine or individuals who don't have migraine at all. So it seems, based on the scientific data, that CGRP plays a very important role in migraine physiology. And so what would happen if we blocked the actions of CGRP? One would assume that we would be able to treat migraine attacks and perhaps reduce the frequency and severity of migraine attacks. So that was the hypothesis going into all of these clinical trials. And so what several of the clinical trials have looked at something called a CGRP monoclonal antibody. Now the word antibody does make it a little confusing, makes it seem like it's going to do something to the immune system, but it's not. The antibody actually acts as Remember that old school arcade game, Pac-Man? So the antibody, the CGRP monoclonal antibody acts like a Pac-Man and just consumes any existing CGRP or maybe even the receptor. And that results in reduced CGRP activity. So there have been a number of studies that have been done with specifically four anti-CGRP treatments. And the good news is every single one of these studies, whether they be performed in people who have episodic migraine, less than 15 headache days per month, or even chronic migraine, 15 or more headache days per month, every study has demonstrated benefit. So what is benefit? Benefit was determined by a reduction in the number of headache days per month. In the studies, on average, people, the studies found that there was a reduction of four to six headache days per month. In addition, there's another outcome measure that's called the 50% responder rate. So that is the proportion of patients that had 50% or less headache days that month. So I have migraine, if I typically have 10 headache days per month, and I responded to this medication, I would now be having five headache days per month, or maybe even less. So these studies found that greater than 50% of patients 
had at least a 50% reduction in the number of attacks that they were having every month. These are some of the best results that we have seen in migraine treatment studies. The other very interesting thing is there seems to be a super responder group, a group of individuals with migraine who have an amazing response to this treatment option specifically. The other amazing thing is the side effect profile. This is a disease specific targeted treatment. And we thought, hypothesized, that they would probably have less side effects. What we were not expecting is the fact that in these trials, the side effect profile was about the same as placebo. And so these drugs are very well tolerated and have very minimal side effects in the clinical trials. So everything always has its pros and cons. And before I jump into some questions, I want to just review some of the pros as well as the cons of the anti-CGRP treatments. The pros, let's start with the good news first. They seem to work. Now the con of that is they work in some patients. So unfortunately, there will be some patients that have migraine that won't respond to CGRP. But don't lose hope. There is a lot of scientists that are working on different mechanisms that cause migraine and then will develop different migraine treatments. Some will respond to CGRP, some will respond to other treatments, okay? And so CGRP drugs do seem to work for some patients and they seem to work quite well for those patients with very minimal side effects. Now, the majority of these studies are short-term studies, ranging from anywhere from six to 12 weeks. They are now doing some longer studies where they're monitoring these patients over the course of a year. However, we don't know what the long-term side effects are from anti-CGRP treatment. CGRP is located in many places throughout the body, in the skin, in the gastrointestinal tract, in the cardiovascular system. And so we, not, we have not seen any side effects in those systems in these shorter duration studies, but we'll have to see what occurs with long-term anti-CGRP treatment. Now the other cool thing about the CGRP treatments is they work very fast based on the initial studies. As many of you know who have tried oral medications, they can take two to three months to kick in. And by that time, a lot of patients lose hope and they stop the medication. However, these medications in some of the initial clinical trials have shown benefit as early as one week. So that provides a lot of patients hope that they'll know if this treatment is effective or not in about a week or so. The other thing is these medications don't need to be taken daily, um, which is something that a lot of my patients ask me about is I don't want to take a medication daily, and so this is an option for a lot of those patients that don't do well with daily medications. Now, it is a very large molecule, um, and so it can't be taken orally. And so one of the cons is that it has to be injected. And so it can either be injected subcutaneously, just underneath the skin, or one of the four drugs is actually an infusion. Um, where you would have to go in likely to a doctor's office and get an IV and you get that infusion. However, these large molecules have a very long half-life. And so remember I said you didn't have to take it daily. In fact, for one of these, the infusion, you only need it perhaps once every three months. And for the other ones, the subcutaneous injection um, trials demonstrated efficacy given uh, once every two weeks or given once a month. And so given the longer half-life, um, they are dosed less frequently. Now, one of the last things that I want to talk about before I answer questions is another con. And this is one that many of you have already asked me about, access and affordability. Now, I don't know the answer as to how much these treatment options are going to be, but this is what I will tell you. All of this is being discussed right now. And there is an organization that's called the Institute for Clinical Economic Review. Again, it's called the Institute for Clinical Economic Review, 
and for short, it's called ICER, I-C-E-R. This is an organization that reviews new treatments and tries to, weighs the, tries to weigh the clinical benefits and the economic impact of these treatment options. This is where you, the migraine patient and the migraine advocate comes in. ICER has now developed a document that indicates what are the things that they're going to consider. This was available for public comment, and I know many of you may have commented regarding this, and they are going to incorporate the public's views into their evaluation of the clinical benefits and the economic impact. So it is important for you to um, join your migraine advocacy organizations, um, stay alert on American Migraine Foundation and the Move Against Migraine page, because we will alert you of when ICER needs their next set of public comments and make sure that you become a part of the process to ensure that migraine patients that need this treatment get this treatment in an accessible and affordable way, the best way that we can.